All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is August 20th, 2022. And as you can tell from today's title, I believe it will be today's title, uh, Revelation 12, The Whole Story. We've talked on Revelation 12 before. I've done a video on Revelation 12 before. But this time, it's going to be the complete story of Revelation 12, starting from verse 1. We're going to tie in the biblical connections all over Scripture that's going to reveal the entirety of Revelation chapter 12. And what inspired me to do this is the, the recent revelation that gave us the understanding of what Revelation 12.1 is going to be. So we're going to put it all together in a nice, beautiful package, and we're going to tie in some new understanding to the beginning of it as well. Some new revelation, I should say, um, of a word that we realized yesterday from our sister, I believe it was our sister DD or BB, one of the two, sorry, I mix it up. We have DD in the ministry, we have BB in the ministry, and uh, it was yesterday during the live show on Interrupts 165. So we're going to tie that in today too. For anybody that doesn't know Interrupts 165, this is his channel. It's Mike and all the brothers and sisters over there. We do live shows with them uh, on a regular basis. And uh, yesterday, it was a lot of fun. We just did it yesterday. So some people are surprised sometimes that I've got a video coming right after spending, you know, two and a half, three hours over there, um, as we all did. And uh, but we're back today because it's the timing of the next video here on Ministry Revealed. So we had a lot of fun. Mike had a great idea of doing uh, uh, of doing quizzes, uh, you know, questions and answer uh, to see people's knowledge. So it was a lot of fun. And we shared some things. And we went into a piece of scripture in Deuteronomy um, that we've talked about a lot. And something was caught by our sister. And it was perfect. It was the connection that that helped bring together what we've been understanding here in this season and time that we're in. So we're going to get into that. We're going to we're going to show this of course, you know, we talk about this beginning portion this this 50 and this in particular 40 day period of time when the son of man is going to show up, when the bride is going to be taken out, the son of man shows up, there's a worker group with them, then they'll remain and go through seals. There's going to be a new group of apostles, whoever they might be, they're going to be here as well. And so we're going to talk about a little bit about that 50 day portion and how it connects in Revelation 12. And then we're going to carry on right through into all these things in Revelation uh, chapter 12. The whole, the whole chapter you're going to see revealed in scripture before your eyes. For anybody that's new to Ministry Revealed, let me first start by doing this. Let me bring this up. Okay, so that is if you come into the description box under any video here, you'll see all of our links. Okay, so there's a link to the support. There's a link to the book on Amazon that we have. But don't worry, you don't have to pay for it. Everything in this ministry is free. I mean, if you go to Amazon, you want the paperback, well, you're gonna have to pay for it. But if you want the book and you don't wanna pay, you can download it for free by clicking right here. And the other thing you can do is you can go to our website, which is linked in here somewhere. Here it is down here, ministryrevealed.com. Okay, you can come and get all the links, the, the charts that we show. Everything is available. All the videos are over there. Our brother Jimmy uh, does such an awesome job. He built the website. It's a fantastic website. And it's got a one-click download button for any video that you want to download and save, whether you want to share it, whether you want to study it, uh, whether you want to save it for left behind, however you want to do it. All right? So... Um, it's in the description box under every video and or you can just go directly to ministryrevealed.com. Uh, I guess the other thing now that I remember too is um, I wanted to say a thank you for, for everybody's prayers, for everybody's support uh, that has come in since the last video. We're so very, very grateful. We appreciate it. We know it's not just the support. It's also the prayers. It's the interceding and it's not just for ourselves. It's for the entirety of the ministry. Everywhere we're reaching, you know, with the 8,700 subscribers, we're all over the world. We're in countries everywhere. And that's why you'll notice another thing that I do, it might take a two, three days or so generally, maybe a little bit more sometimes between videos, but you'll see that there's closed caption. And I do a closed caption for something like 50 different languages 
uh, so that when somebody watches a video, if their English isn't very good, uh, they can read the subtitles. Is it perfect? No, but it'll really help and you'll get a really good idea. So anyways, I wanted to thank everybody. It's greatly appreciated. And now for anybody else that's new, you're going to hear some things that is going to make you question, but it's going to make you question in a beautiful, beautiful way. You're going to hear things like 14 year tribulation. What is this guy talking about? Or you're going to hear that the gospels have been opened. There, there's a revelation of who the gospels are speaking to. And that's where you're going to begin your understanding if you're new. And it's this right. playlist right here called the Revealed End Time Study Note Series. It starts with this 30 minute intro, and it is so important. It is the number one key to the entirety of Revelation. And that's how it started for me on September 8th, just like it says here. By the way, these printouts, when you want it, when you see something like this in a video, the printout is in the description box as well. Um, and again, it's available on the website. This right here is where it all began, September 8th, 2017 for me. And it started with this revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. And how it started was something we're going to talk about just in brief today as we get to that, which was Revelation chapter 12 was part of it. And it was so important because it was in that moment, in that video I did back in on September 8th, 2017, in that video where I said, oh, wait a second. Something just caught my attention here. And I said, well, if anything comes from it, I'll let you guys know. The entire rest of this ministry has been built on the foundation of that revelation. And now we can go from the beginning of Genesis in the beginning to the end of Revelation chapter 22 and reveal the entire picture of the end of days because of the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. You're going to find out in this video right here, this little 30-minute intro Bible study, you're going to find out that the Matthew, Mark, and Luke of the Synoptic Gospels, in the end, just like the Scripture says, the last will be first, the first will be last. You're going to find out that Luke is to the bride of Christ, those ready and watching to be accounted worthy, to escape all these things that are about to pass. Okay, They're going to be gone first. It's the bride of Christ. But Luke also knows all things, so there's more in there as well. You're going to find out in Mark that he's speaking to the, the house of Israel. That's It's called the world. And in in aspect of the world, uh, uh, to the Gentiles, to the sleeping church, it's Israel, the house of Israel that's scattered all over the world, grafted in with the Gentiles. They're called the world. That's considered the sleeping church that we say. Those who might believe some of them, but they're just not ready. They're just not watching. They're still caught up in the things of this world. That is the portion that will remain during the portion, the, the tribulation of seals. We have shown this from 100 plus to 300 different ways in Scripture. And you're going to begin to understand that in this video. And finally, Matthew is to the Jews. Now, to the, and house, the house of Judah. And what's interesting is most of the world knows this, or much of the world, that uh, it, the, the, the pastors and so forth, they've known this. But the problem is they never really understood who Mark or Luke were written to. They maybe had an idea with Mark, but they could never really fully understand. And Luke, they never really understood either. Here in this ministry, in this 30-minute video, you're going to begin to understand it. And if you want to go even deeper, then go download the free book or buy the book. I would say just download it. It doesn't matter if you want to buy it unless you want a, a paperback, a hard copy. But you can go to the website. It's in, I think, five different languages to download. And if you want, if you don't want to download anything, you can actually read it right from the book page on the website. The whole book will pull, will pull up and you can read it right there on the website. So um, what you can do is this is just a little intro. You can go read chapter one of the book after and really start to sink your teeth into this revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. It is going to rock your scripture world and it'll be one of the best, maybe not the best, you know, your salvation is first, but one of the best things to open up your understanding that you will have ever taken the time to do. I promise you, every moment you take in this 30-minute video will be worth your time. And you're going to see things like what, what people call discrepancies, what caused a lot of people to turn away because these it seemed like writers were writing about the same stories, but they were writing differently. You're going to realize 
that what it was all about was prophecy. Prophecy was built into the stories of the gospel. You're going to see things. Uh, here's, here's a very famous one that we talk about in this in this intro series as well, which is the color of robe Jesus was arrayed in going to um, the crucifixion. In Luke, it said it was a gorgeous robe. It means white, radiant, beautiful. But in Mark, it says that he was arrayed in purple. In Matthew, it says that he was arrayed in scarlet or, or a, a scarlet robe. Now, were these people colorblind? Are they just giving their own opinion from their own perspective and changing the color? No. It's the infallible word of God. So what on earth has happened? Well, you're going to find that out when you watch that this intro and read uh, that portion of the first chapter in the book. It's about who the Gospels are speaking to. Luke is the pre-trib bride of Christ. Mark is the sleeping church rapture in the seventh year of seals of the great multitude rapture. And Mark is when the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. Did you hear that? Anybody that's new, did you catch that? All these debates for what, two, 200 years about whether pre, mid, or post-tribulation are all true and bouncing around from one to the other. When you understand who the Gospels are speaking to, you're going to find out that all three of them are in fact true. And that's what this video goes into right here, pre, mid, and post. They're all true. And you can see the types and shadows in them with the triumphal entry, the transfiguration, and the resurrection. It's absolutely mind-blowing. But what you want to see next after this one is video number two, the intro to the 14-year revelation. You see, we've all been taught it was seven years because everybody's foundation, whether they realize it or not, is from the book of Matthew. So not only is your prophecy in seven-year thinking founded from Matthew, but all of your perspective is shaped because you're learning everything from Matthew. When Matthew has nothing to do with you unless you're a Jew. You see, it will blow your mind because Luke's group that goes pre-trib is a portion before the 14 years begins. The Mark portion is seals and in Revelation chapter 7, you see the great multitude rapture that happens after the sixth seal and before the seventh. That is the great multitude rapture in the seventh year. Then you have Matthew's portion to the Jews, which are the seven years of trumpets. It's going to blow you away. That's what you're going to start to understand in the second intro. Then I recommend this one right here. This one is going to reveal the understanding of these two in how it was missed. Why wasn't it understood? And I say, that it's a great title. It's called, It's All Because of Matthew. All right. And from there, you can go in and you can go search through all of these. You're going to see, we're going to talk a little bit of some of these today as well, the seven churches. That's been a mystery with all of this. It's been a mystery for, for centuries in relation to how the seven churches are going to play a part again in the end of days, right? We know that there, there's a typology in the Old Testament of the seven churches in, the, in these portions of time. There's since Christ to where we are now, the is, until the moment of the escape, we're living in the is. And that is, is the seven churches from Christ till now as well. And we're in the Laodicean age. But as soon as the escape happens, those seven churches will play out again. But this time, instead of over thousands of years, the story is going to play out over 14 years. It's, it, it's, it's, I'm telling you, it still blows me away every single day I talk about it. I'm, I'm, it's it just, it's absolutely incredible. Here's the, the 11th video. You can understand the discourse is revealed like you have never understood them before. All these little differences, all of these little uh, um, differences within their conversation is because they're speaking to different people at different portions of time. It's, it's awesome. It is so incredible. Now time for a sip of coffee. So let's get into this. Let's start right here. We're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 16, and I'm going to share with you guys 
this piece in Deuteronomy 16 that showed up to us yesterday from what our sister had shared. We were going through these three feasts of the Lord. Okay, we know it's Passover, Feast of Weeks, and Feast of Booths. And for us, an understanding in this is, is vital. Okay, we know it's the putting the sickle to the corn. It relates to the pre-trib bride of Christ. Remember, for anybody that's new, as I mentioned a moment ago, there's a very famous verse, uh, a chapter that we go to often here, and it's Paul giving us, yes, we know it's a story of what Paul was talking about and what had taken place in the is, but within it is the revelation of the is to come. And he talks about being being here like 14 years later. Okay, He's talking to them as if he's here the third time, ready to come to them. Okay. And this is when he's coming to them this time. It's like the Lord coming feet down. And he starts, though, by saying, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. And where did this one go? Well, it was like a rapture. Okay, the word means like a caught up, like a harpazo. And they go to the third heaven. And then I knew another one, he says, such a man. So not directly in Christ like the first group, but similar. And this one was caught up, and this one goes to paradise, okay? This is the Luke group, this is the Mark group, and him coming the third time is then when he comes to the Jews, and he returns to them, and he'll gather them back, and so forth, all right? You see, it's above 14 years. This is the portion for the escape of the bride of Christ, and we are expecting it this year between now and the time of the fall feasts because this portion of time is called above, and you, you'll come to understand that the Son of Man is going to be here for 40 days, as he told us in Luke 17, when he said he will be here uh, as Noah was at, until the time when the ark door shut. He's going to be here. His days will be as those 40 days in that craziness. Okay? You'll understand a lot of these differences. You'll be able to see things like... um. Uh, the Luke, Mark, and Matthew, when they talk about um, uh, uh, the story of, of Jonah, okay? Jonah, Jesus says he would be as Jonah was. So he's going to give a warning for 40 days as Jonah did. But in Mark, he says, you're not going to get anything, and he leaves. In Matthew, he says it'll be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That never happened yet. You follow? It's prophecy built into the scripture, into the gospels, because Christ was never yet a warning as Jonah was. Christ was not three days and three nights in the grave. If he resurrected on the third day, people like to say, oh, a portion of one day and a portion of another, the Jews call that three days. It's not true because the scriptures tell us three days and three nights. Yet the story of his resurrection when he was here was two and a half days approximately. He resurrected on the third day. That's impossible for three days and three nights in the grave, especially when the story begins from when he's taken into the hands of sinful men. You see, it's caused so much confusion because we've all learned from Matthew. These are all things that are part of the prophecy built into Scripture. But in this pre-portion right here, this group in Christ that goes above 14 years, We've had a piece of scripture that we've been talking about for a long time that we know is to the bride of Christ. We revealed it in, in the revelation of what we call chapters to years. And when you come here to Exodus 34, 22, it says, and thou shalt observe. See that? Thou shalt do. Okay, you're going to accomplish. You're going to do the observing, the celebrating of the Feast of Weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest and comma and meaning a separate thing, but you're going to do them together and the feast of in gathering at the year's end. Okay. For the longest time, I thought this was going to be directly related to uh, uh, the circuit of the sun, meaning this, this time in June at, um, uh, 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 at uh, <laughs> the solstice. And what you're seeing is this feast of weeks of the first fruits. That is the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ is the first fruits of the wheat harvest. 
So what you're going to see is the bride of Christ is going to be gone in that above portion, above 14 years. And that, we believe, is about to happen this month. Yes, we believe that at other points, I'm not saying thus saith the Lord. It's revelation of, of scripture. It's understanding. It's, it's a piece of the Bible, a bite at a time and a bite at a time over these four and a half, almost five years that have continued to give us the clearer picture. And as we've been getting closer, it's been getting absolutely fantastic, even crazier than it's been in the past, because we know it starts a new season. A, a, a new Shemitah cycle starts this fall at the fall feasts. So if the bride of Christ is the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the first fruits of the wheat harvest are to be taken out before the feast of ingathering, but they're going to be observed at the same time. This is a very important word to us. That's why it's highlighted so dark. We've understood this for a long time. And here's the word, 6213, the Hebrew word to do or make. And so when we were in the live show yesterday talking and the sister shared something, we were going through this and we see the word observe in Deuteronomy 6.1. And we saw it in, I saw it in Feast of Booths, right? Tabernacles. But at first I didn't see it in uh, the Feast of Weeks. So I thought, wait a second, maybe there's something there. Well, then we start searching and, um, and Taylor says, oh, there it is right there. And so we did see the word observe in all three. But then our sister, sorry, I think it's Bibi, um, says, well, guys, did you notice there's a different word? Look at the word for Passover observing. It's to guard, to protect, to hedge about. <coughs> Excuse me. Then we come to the one for the Feast of Weeks. And this one says the same thing, 8104, to observe, to, to hedge about, to guard. And then when we come to the Feast of Booths, look at this. And thou shalt observe, and look at the word, 6213. See that? 6213, to make or do. It's not the same as the one from Passover or the one for Feast of Weeks because he told us in Exodus 34:22 that what you're going to do is you're going to observe the Feast of Weeks that was already brought in, but you're going to observe it. You're going to observe the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the Feast of Ingathering at the year's end. And what was the observe? There you go. 62.13. Do you see that? So the Bride of Christ, the Gentile Bride of Christ, time of observing, those who are going to be taken out pre-trib, which I believe will be when 8 billion people is reached, the actual number, which we're very close to now. We know they don't know exactly the number, but they know it is so close to happening. I've been teaching on that for over four years of a revelation in scripture that I had <coughs> that I believe proved that pre-flood, there were 8 billion people on the earth. That from... The, from then until now, at the moment of the escape, there will be 8 billion people on the earth. And then again, after tribulation is all done and everything starts during the millennial reign, from all those who are left and people living hundreds of years again, it will go to 8 billion people again. And it will be 8, 8, 8. It was a revelation I had, like I said, about four years ago. And it, it looks like it's proving true because we're moments away from hitting 8 billion. And look at what it says in Deuteronomy 16, 13. And thou shalt observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days after you have gathered in thy corn and thy wine. Okay? After you gathered it in. So when we've talked about this, where is this period of time? This is the last day of gathering it in. Because this is the party. This is is the celebration. So if we went back and we did the 50-day count from it, we're looking, <coughs> I believe it's right here, that as I'm speaking to you right now, I believe that the 50 days has begun and we're not necessarily expecting to see anything right on day one. But are we expecting to see something within this first seven to then the eighth day, okay? This is the eighth day that starts right here. This is the eighth day. 
this is the day expected for the Son of Man to return. Um, uh, uh, sorry, for the Son of Man to be here, and it'll be the escape of the Bride of Christ. But we're expecting something true in this time. We have understood here in this ministry that there is an event that we will know about that we will see coming before the escape. Will the bride be, be a part of it? Will the bride actually remain when it happens? No. I believe the bride will be gone. I believe the scripture is clear that the bride will be gone before, as you guys know, it impacts. And I believe that that's going to be somewhere around here. Not the impact, <clears throat> but that we should see this thing coming. When you do this calculation and you do the 40 days of the Son of Man starting on a little one, which is, as you guys know, the, the king is in the field. My beloved is mine and mine is my beloved. If that's day one, well, it's an easy count, right? Just count all the days of Elul. There's 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. The Son of Man is gone after 40 days, and we know that there's one, two, three days left to the time of the Holy Ghost and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. When that happens, Holy Ghost leaves, and what do we have? The beginning of the 14 years. Well, when the beginning of the 14 years happens, we know that what? It's going to begin nation against nation. This is the attack that will happen when the, bright, when, when the 50 days have ended, the Holy Ghost is removed, peace is removed from the earth, and it starts at nation against nation nation. Do you know how important that is? Because most of us, most people will say, well, the tribulation begins at the white horse rider. It's not true. The tribulation actually begins at nation against nation, right? You can, you can go into to all the discourses you want, and you could see that at nation against nation, let's go to Mark 13, for example. Go to Mark 13. Actually, no, let's go to Luke 21. You can do it in Mark in Mark 13 as well. But if we go to Luke's discourse in Luke chapter 21, we see it right here. He said unto them, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. That's the beginning of the actual 14 years. That's the beginning of the tribulation. We know there's an attack first, right? We know that there's a stone's throw or the stone's throw first and there's an attack somewhere in there. That, that's the northern part of Israel. And the Lord shows up. The 40 days play out. There's three more days to the Holy Ghost. And then it's nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And it will start with a great attack on Jerusalem in the core of the land. And the Jews will flee. And as we know, they're going to be removed for seven years because the land must rest before the Lord can build on it. So look at what it says. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. But Luke 12, uh, Luke 21 verse 12 says, but before all these, okay? He's saying, but before all these. You don't see this in Mark. You don't see it in Matthew. You only see it in Luke. Why? Because he's saying, but before all of this, before nation against nation, earthquake, fearful sights, and all those things, before all of this, the bride is gone. And before all this, this is the 40 days of the Son of Man. This is the white horse rider who comes as the warning, like he said, the 40 days of Noah were in Luke 17, as well as the, the story with Luke 11, as he said with Jonah. So you see, the real, the real tribulation, quote unquote, begins at nation against nation. That's the red horse rider. Can you technically say it's the above 14 years portion? I think you could you could still, you know, there you could still say it because tens of millions of people will have vanished. The Lord will be here warning. You see? So in in a way, yes, of course it's begun, but the real stuff begins after he's gone and the Holy Ghost anoints and then the Holy Ghost is gone. That's when it really starts. That's where it'll really start to get chaotic. You see, let's see, let's show more connections to this. You see, this period of time that we're looking for within that count of the bride being gone, then the 40 days of the Son of Man, 
then the Holy Ghost, and then everything beginning. Well, that means when the first seven years, let me show you what I'm talking about. For those that are new, when I'm saying, you see, this, this right here is are the 14 years, seven of seals and seven of trumpets. But there's a bigger picture. And the bigger picture is actually 21 years. They're the final three sets of seven in a Shemitah year count. Okay, the final Shemitah year will be the year after the Lord has returned and the 14 years are over. This is the final Jubilee Shemitah right here. When the lands will be returned and the, the land will be divided into all the different tribes and the millennial reign will begin. But... There's a seven-year portion that came first. And this seven-year portion, you'll notice it's not tribulation. It's just like Jacob, right? Jacob thought he was going to work for, for Rachel. He said they were, he was so excited. He was so in love. The first seven years flew by like days, you see? So it wasn't a burden for him. It wasn't a big deal. This is the time where the Holy Spirit has been waking people up like crazy to prepare them, to get them watching and praying and seeking. This is that period of time. Well, if you follow the story of what happened with Leah and Rachel and Jacob, you see what happened at the end of 20 years. He worked seven years, got Leah. Then he had to fulfill her wedding week. And then he had to work seven more years for Rachel. And then he worked six years for the cattle. And when the 20 years were over, he made a covenant with his father-in-law. That's exactly what you read. The final year is the covenant time, just like Daniel 9, 27. That's where it fits. Okay? But what happens, what we're talking about here at this beginning, this, this little 50-day portion, 50, 43-day portion, what, it, what is it that happens here? Well, if we follow the story, because you see, one thing we've been trying to understand is is how the where where's this wedding where is the wedding going to be for the gentile bride and for the longest time we've been believing now not solid not solidly but we've been believing it was possible that the 7 days before the 40 days begin would be the wedding week and we've kind of gone back and forth and back and forth on it but it never really sat strong with us. So now that we're seeing this understanding that the bride is gone, the 40 days of the Son of Man, we know we're going to see events within that week before. Okay? We know it. It's a biblical fact. We're going to see a stone's throw come within this week, probably in this time, where it'll be seen, and then people will realize, uh-oh, and there's going to be panic, and before it breaks through and hits, the bride's gone. All right, this is what's coming. Now, it's not looking like this is where the wedding is, okay? And it, like I said, it wasn't something we were solid and we were kind of, you know, ugh, we couldn't really be sure. But now, as we've realized this count and we found the Lord's year's end, which is the harvest, and that this is the celebration, just like he told us in Leviticus 19, which is another vastly important, hugely important piece of scripture that we have, which he said, when you come into the land, three years you can't take from it, the fourth year is to me. And then the fifth year forward, it's yours to eat. This was the revelation of the count of 70 years, meaning the first three years, it wasn't theirs. The fourth year, it wasn't theirs. It was to the Lord. But from the fifth year forward, it was theirs. And that's, as you guys know, we've taught on this, we've showed it a number of times, when Israel came into the land and they decided on what, what year of the Shemitah they were in, they did massive studies, they went back through centuries and centuries, I believe even a few thousand years, and they came up with four years left in the Shemitah cycle when they came into the land in 1948. And Leviticus showed us that it was three years and one to the Lord, and then it was theirs to begin, that they could start now eating from it. And it just so happens that that's what they decided on, four years, and then a new Shemitah cycle started. That's why this year is the Shemitah cycle. If you take it from after the four and you begin at the fifth, that makes this year the 70th year. And as you guys know, this is for new people, 
the reason it's so important, there's there's dozen scriptures on it, but you see this in Psalms 90 and 10. The days of your years are 70. And if they be 80, yet is their strength labor. See? Tra- travail, sorrow, trouble, pain, affliction. That's 10 years. Starting at 70. When 70 is done, boom, day one. It starts. Well, what did we just show at day one? When the 14 years begins, it's going to start nation against nation. That's 10 years. Then you have, for it is soon cut off. That's a short period of time. I believe that that number is about six months. And then we fly away. We're going to talk about this in Revelation chapter 12. This we fly away is the final three and a half years of trumpets. So you've got 10 years, six months, and three and a half years. This is when the Jews, when they're going to be taken away, fly away on the wings of an eagle and protected in the wilderness till the 14 years is over. That's 14 years right there. Why is it important? Because it's 70. 70 is so important. And so when we come into Leviticus 19, and now we know that we are in the 70th year, and when it ends at the Lord God's timing, hello, the proverbial you know what's going to hit the fan in a more serious way than ever before in human history. It'll begin with that attack on Jerusalem. It'll be the lion from the north and those with them. Jerusalem will be removed. The Jews will be removed from the land. And that will begin nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. That will be followed, as we said, by World War III. That will last about two and a half years. But you see this? This is a key piece of scripture right here. I remember this with our brother Ivan from South Africa. This was, oh, at least a couple of years ago. And or oh, maybe not quite a couple of years ago, somewhere around there anyways. And we we came across this and realized we had this revelation on it. Another brother had shared it. And I saw the word praise and Ivan had shared something. And I thought he was relating to the, the word praise here. And he was like, oh, no, I didn't even notice that. We went in and we started digging further into it. Look at what it says. In a sense of rejoicing. A celebration of thanksgiving for harvest. There is only one time of year where there is a celebration of thanksgiving for harvest, brothers and sisters. And that celebration for thanksgiving of harvest is the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Boots or Sukkot, some some call it as well. All right. That is this one-week period. It's fantastic. But remember this? We were talking about Leah, right? Let's go back into Genesis uh, 29 and look at what we see here. We see, of course, that that he comes across her and he's so excited, right? It starts in uh, verse 29, uh, sorry, Genesis 29, verse 20. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel And they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had for her. Jacob said unto Laban, unto Laban, give me my wife for my days are fulfilled that I may go in unto her. Now, when was this? The moment after seven years, after the seven years were done. As soon as the seven years were done, he was saying, bang. Give me my wife. And look at what happened. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. He goes in unto her. He wakes up the next morning and everybody knows the story. He was deceived. But Laban tells him, look, you can't have the younger. You must have the older, the firstborn. Who is this firstborn? You see the eldest, the eldest. That's what the first fruits of the wheat harvest is. It's the old wheat, not because it's old and and rotten, but because of when it's planted. It's the old wheat. It's the winter wheat. That's the layup type of shadow, type and shadow of the Gentile bride of Christ. So when the seven seven years are over and then all this happens and go in unto her and now she becomes his, what does Laban tell him? Fulfill her week fulfill her week and then work seven more years for Rachel, who I'm still going to give you once you fulfill her week. You see that? Fulfill her week. 
when the seven years of o are over. And then what? Fulfill her week at what? A harvest celebration. This is going to be the wedding of the Gentile bride of Christ. You see, because one of the things that was also confusing is that if the Son of Man is going to be here, if the bride is gone, the Son of Man then comes and warns and is a light to the Mark group, to those that remain, when is he supposed to marry his bride? It always seemed odd, didn't it? And that was one of the reasons I was very apprehensive about it being the first week. Because then all of a sudden he's leaving. And then all of a sudden, you know, is he leaving right away? Or is the bride going to go? And then all of a sudden, bang, we're going to get married. And it, it, it just didn't fit. When we read the story of Jacob and we see that the seven years were complete and then you have the seven day wedding. Now it makes sense. See, it wasn't fully making sense how we, we would get to Tishri. It's because we're not leaving here. The bride is still leaving above 14 years, but the Lord has to now come and warn the world. And then when he's done and the Holy Ghost anoints, then when the Holy Ghost returns, the wedding will commence. It's awesome. It's fantastic. And that's why this word praise became such a big deal now that we've understood it. We have understood it. It is the end of the harvest season, and that's why it's so important. All right? So now, how does this apply? What is it with this timing in relation to Revelation chapter 12? Now we can see again. Am I saying I know with certainty? No, I told you already. I'm the best of my ability knowing that this starts the seventh, the, the new Shemitah cycle. That the Lord God counts it from the end of his harvest in bringing in. So if this is the beginning of a new Shemitah cycle and it started with after four years and that's what the scripture said, not Alan, but scripture that Alan's showing you, where else is it supposed to be? It's the end of the line. It's the end of the line for the 70 years. This is why we're so excited in this ministry, okay? But how does it all begin? Sometime within this week, we are expecting, regardless, if it doesn't happen this year and it's not for another, I don't know how long, the way we will know it's about to begin is we will see a meteor coming before. That's how we're going to know. And it might even be an attack in northern Israel as well. Okay? I believe it's a combination of both. But we definitely hear what we're doing today is we're talking about the meteor. There is definitely going to be a stone's throw that we're going to see. Okay? And that stone's throw is, ex is expected in this 7 to the 8th day. Okay? All this in here. That's the 7 after 7 days to the 8th day is just like Noah's story. After seven days, which means sometime on the eighth day, the door was shut and the 40 days began. Same thing, okay? So what does this eight days represent before the 40? Well, we've known it, right? This is something we've been talking about here in this ministry for a long time. First of all, we, and we talked about it yesterday in the live show, one of the things we know is that the, the story of the count of the Feast of Weeks was Matthew and Mark after Christ's resurrection. Then the 50 days begin in John's resurrection story, and it's from the beginning of the 50 to the eighth day. He meets with them briefly again on the eighth day when he suddenly shows up again, and then he goes to Luke's group in chapter 24, and when he gets there, it's the only one that says at the resurrection story that the body of the Lord Jesus wasn't found. This is one of the places we have shown the typology of the body, the bride of Christ, gone. And then what does it say? They were much perplexed. You see, you can see something like that. This is something we've shared a number of times too, where this is from 2nd Esdras, right? The apocryphal book, 2nd Esdras chapter 13, starting in verse 29. Behold, the days are coming when the Most High will deliver those who are on the earth, 
and bewilderment of mind shall come over those who dwell on the earth. What's bewilderment of mind? What's a synonymous word with it? Bewilderment. Bewilderment and perplexed are synonymous. And then look at what it says. And they shall plan to make war against one another, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Hello. You see? Escape of the bride of Christ. They're bewildered. The 40 days of the Son of Man begin. When it's over, when the 50-day portion is over at the 14-year start, bang, there's a seven-day wedding in heaven when the first attack or uh, uh, when the attack on Jerusalem takes place by Syria and the Jews are removed from the land and then World War III breaks out. You see, it didn't even happen right away. It says, and they shall plan to make war. Yeah, it's already in the plans for sure. It has it all in order. Escape of the body of Christ and bewilderment. What do we see? Escape of the body. The body's not found and they were perplexed. It's fantastic. This is the beginning time of the 40 days. And what do we see? It's Jesus' resurrection story. He shows up unto two of them and it's the story of the 40 days beginning. So if you want to see why there's differences and you understand the timing of each of the groups, we can then say, okay, well, what if we go into the resurrection story in the Luke one and see what the process of those, you know, to the third day was, you see? And the third day he rose again. So when did it start? It said that he was delivered into the hands of sinful men first and comma and crucified, comma and the third day he rose. You see, because that means the count began from the moment he was taken into the hands of sinful men. So let's go back and see that story of when he was taken into the hands of sinful men. And we see this very interesting piece that only shows up in Luke. We've talked about it many times. And when Jesus, after the, the Passover meal, he goes to the Mount of Olives and he's, he's going to pray. And it says in verse 41, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast. Very strange wording to put in. He's literally saying, I'm only a stone's throw away. Very interesting wording. Well, we've come to understand and we've revealed it through so much scripture. We know that he is a stone's throw away, meaning when we see the stone's throw, when we see this meteor coming, he's almost here. He's only a stone's throw away is what he's telling us. And when we took this into John, so when would this stone's throw be in relation to the, the story of his resurrection? Well, if this is the early in the morning, when he's going to show up in Luke 24 in the typology of it, well, then you have what? This is the evening portion. This is like the 15th day, right, of the first month. And this would be like the 14th day of the first month. Okay, in the typology, in the resurrection story, in Luke to this end of days connection. So this would be the 14th. This would be the 15th. There's the evening of the 15th, of the 16th. And he resurrected and showed himself on that eighth day early in the morning to the Luke group in his resurrection story. So that means if this is the 14th, then sometime in the evening, before, right before he was taken into the hands of sinful men, and uh, uh, um, when they had finished the Passover meal, somewhere in here in the evening, he tells them he is a stone's throw away. Now, this is important to us as well. Because we've also known from John chapter 8, which is one of our chapters to years books, see, 21 chapters, the first seven easy, the bride is taken, and look at what happens. It's this early in the morning, this woman caught in adultery brought to him. She's a typology of a, of a Ruth, right? Because it just means, uh, it means a Gentile woman is a, is a term for it, just like, um, uh, just like dogs are, <laughs> are termed as Gentiles as well, right? And what do they want to do? They want to stone her. And he turns around and he says to them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. So the only one that was without sin was Christ. So only Christ can cast that first stone. Here it is talking about it. While he's there and she's now standing before him, as if he's on bended knee, writing in the sand, and everybody's gone, and it's only him, and he's looking up to her like it's a proposal. And then what do we see? Bang. 
I am the light of the world. Why? Because he's coming to bring light into the darkness because the bride is gone. Okay, now it's going to be chaos. Chaos is going to begin at the start of 40 days. The meteor is going to hit. And then a lot of other craziness, I believe, like Psalms 18 is going to take off. There he is, light of the world, just like he said he would come the second time because he's coming for Mark's group, which relates to the light portion. So we've seen this in all sorts of places. And now when we go to Revelation chapter 12, the reason it's so important now to understand this is because in the past, I've I've taught on this man, again, this is something probably uh, more than th four and a half years. So I've been doing this almost five years. Well, technically five years, but from September when everything started, it's almost five years. But it's been uh, almost five years since I've understood that the bride of Christ leaves between the end of verse one and the beginning of verse two of Revelation 12. When as, as Revelation 12 had happened, and, and it was getting close. I think it was maybe just after it had happened. And of course, nothing happened. I believe, you know, as we had looked back on it, even back then, you can see now that it was a great time of awakening for those, for the spirit waking up the bride. Okay. And it's still happening now. And I believe Scotty Clark played a massive, important role and he's paid the price for it, right? However, I don't know if he fully realizes the role that he played because so many people, millions and millions of people were looking at that time because of it. And it was a big deal. Of course it was a big deal. But was it the actual sign? No. And I've been saying this probably from the end of September of 2017. And the reason why is because this word right here, this word appeared. Let's look at this word. Haven't We haven't talked on this in a long time. And when I used to share and, and do the, the full teaching on Revelation chapter 12, I never really talked about Revelation 12, 1, because I said the bride always leaves right here. That's never, ever, ever changed. It was the beginning of all revelation in this ministry was this right here. This whole portion of Revelation chapter 12 was the beginning of everything on September 8th. But when you look at this word appeared in verse 1, Listen to what it says. To gaze, that is, with eyes, uh, with wide open eyes, at something remarkable, thus differing from which denotes simply voluntary observation. Hello. And from which expressly merely mechanical, passive, or casual vision. Do you get that? What was Revelation chapter 12? Were we gazing up at something remarkable saying, oh my goodness, no. You couldn't see the Revelation 12 one sign. Nobody could see it. You could see it in, in Stellarium and in programs to look. You can maybe see the front end of it or the back end if you looked in the evening or in the, in the early in the morning before the sun. But it wasn't to gaze on something with eyes wide open at something just absolutely remarkable. It was a simple, it was simply a voluntary observation, merely mechanical. You see, mechanical and just like in just the way you would look up. However, it was also mechanical because we were using computers to look at it. You see, so we understood that it wasn't the actual sign, but it was a sign to prepare us to get us watching. And we know, of course, many fell away from that time, but there were still many that stayed, and I am one of them. And I know many of you guys are as well. So here's what we came to understand. If this is the escape of the bride of Christ, and we've taught on it, we've explained how it is, because this is what happened on September 8th, 2017, when I realized it, because We've all been told by all these prophecy teachers that this right here is the rapture. Well, if, if Revelation 12, 5 is the rapture where it says was caught up, then that means 
It's after a third of the star is falling. It's after the dragon with seven heads and ten horns. It's after the pain and travail. Well, that makes absolutely no sense. Because if the pre-trib is before all these things, this certainly isn't before all these things. This is the mid-trib rapture in the seventh year of seals. And for those who are new, if you remember, I just showed it to you. See the second one? Was caught up. It's the second one. That's exactly what Revelation 12 just said, didn't it? In verse 5. Said the same thing. Was caught up. This is the rapture of the great multitude in the seventh year of seals. So we know all these things are from about mid seals, right? About three and a half, about two and a half years in. But what else did we know? Well, it says in verse two, and she being with child cried, travailing in birth, comma, and meaning a separate thing. It's not the same thing. It's separate. Travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. Well, if she's travailing in birth and pain to be delivered, we had this incredible, and this was my, this was the very first thing. This is what was happening on September 8th, 2017. We all know this very famous verse from Isaiah 66 that told us, verse 7, before she travailed. Uh oh. If before she travailed, she brought forth. So in Revelation chapter 12, verse 2, even before the travailing, there's a bringing forth. So before the travail, that's the bride of Christ gone. Say, you see? And then it says, before her pain, she was delivered of a man child. So now let's go back and check out Revelation chapter 12. In chapter 12, verse 2, it says, And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth. That means before this happens, the bride must be gone. Hello. And what do we know about this travailing in birth? You go to Revelation chapter 6, and look at what we read about the white horse rider. And I saw him behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow. Here's that word bow. Okay, simple as fabric, comes from G5088, and it means to uh, be delivered. It means to be in travail, to be in travail, because the 40 days of the Son of Man are a period of time of travail. They are only the beginning of chaos. Those 40 days are the beginning of chaos while the Son of Man is here warning. You see, look at the word Travail, in travail, look at the word, comes from 5604, sorrow, travail, pangs, 3601, it's akin to it, grief, the whole thing, travailing in birth, this is the 40 days of the Son of Man, but then guess what, if the white horse rider, if the white horse rider is only here in relation to the travailing in birth, right, is only here in reference to this travail and being in travail, then that means his 40 days, when they're up and this travail portion is done, then the pain comes. You see? What did it say? It said before the travail, bang, bride is gone. Christ is the time of travail, the white horse rider. When his 40 days are done, right, and the additional three because of the Holy Ghost, bang, then the pain begins. Because it said, and she brought forth a man-child before the pain. See how that works? It's absolutely perfect. And this is why for almost, well, four and a half plus years, I've been saying the bride of Christ leaves right here. What is the word pain? This word pain, the torture, pain, torment, all of this stuff, this is the two and a half years, the first two and a half years of the tribulation of seals, which relates to world War three. This travailing portion right here is not only the white horse rider of Revelation chapter six with the white horse rider, it's also Luke chapter 21, 
when it says, but before all these, right? But before all these, what's going to suddenly happen? They shall lay their hands on you, persecute you. Who are they doing this to? Who are they going to be bringing up to prisons within these 40 days? The escape happens, and why are all these people going to prison? Why are some of them about to be put in death and be betrayed by family and friends and everybody? Because there's a group of people on the earth that will know what has happened. There's a group of workers. Who is this group? It's that group from Luke's resurrection story in Luke. When he meets the two on the road to Emmaus, there's a group of people, of workers for the Lord, that are going to be with them during the 40 days, and then will be sealed by the Holy Ghost, receive that anointing, and will work during, uh, during the time of seals. This is that Smyrna group we've talked about so much, how some of you will be even caused to be put to death. This is going to happen during the 40 days, and that could be as soon as next Sunday. Because it's before nation against nation. This nation against nation is the pain of Revelation chapter 12, verse 2. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 12 again. <coughs> And let's go now to verse 1. We're seeing a woman and there appeared a and there appeared a great wonder. So something remarkable that people are going to look at and be like, "Ah!" Oh! And it's a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Now what in the world is this? Well, this is, as you guys know, I shared on this, that when I was talking with Mike from 165 a week or two ago, and we were chatting and chatting, and all of a sudden, boom, I had one of those revelation moments. It just, it came right to my mind. I said, hold on, hold on. I went to my laptop. I started looking. I said, oh my goodness. Revelation 12.1 is the stone's throw. You see, we understand this is the escape of the bride of Christ. This is the 40 days of the Son of Man. And this is the first two and a half years of seals at World War III that starts at the beginning of the 14 years. So if that is the beginning with the escape, the 40 days of the Son of Man, and then the beginning of the 14 years, what do we know comes before it? There's only one thing that comes before it. It's right here in this time. There's a period of seven to the eight days that happens before the escape, before the 40 days of the Son of Man, there's only one thing. It's the stone's throw. And what do we know about the stone's throw? We know that it's a period of time that relates. Remember I told you guys, for those of you that were new, one second. For those of you that are new, I was telling you, that you have the Old Testament typology of events relating to the, the typology of the seven churches. This is the Old Testament typology right here. This is the New Testament. So you've got the was and you've got the is. As soon as the escape happens, this right here, this period is done and the tribulation begins. Even, even maybe that first eight days portion, right? Because... What I was just talking to you about, the Luke 24 group, those workers that follow the Lord, the, the group that follows the Lord that begins his 40 days. Remember, the bride is gone, right? So the bride escapes somewhere right in here at the beginning of the 40 days when he shows up. Then you have those disciples that are going to be following him and will be anointed at the 50th day. This group right here is the Smyrna group starting. So if this relates to the Smyrna group, which we have proven a dozen different ways over many videos, and we know this is the time of Smyrna. I remember what Smyrna says, right? In, in uh, Revelation chapter 2 with the seven churches, we see Smyrna right here. And it says, you see that some of you, they shall cause to be put into prison, right? Uh, be not fearful unto death. This is that same group from Luke chapter 24, uh, Luke chapter 21, that some of them are going to be put to death. So we know it's the Smyrna group. So do we have something before Smyrna? 
we have Ephesus. Do we have something in Revelation 12 before the escape and the 40 days of the Son of Man like Luke 24? Yes, we've got verse 1. So how on earth does this great wonder that people are going to be looking at with eyes wide open in amazement, what is this that has to happen before the escape at the 40 days? Well, in every point I've just shown you, there's only one thing. The stone's throw. There's one event that's going to happen related to Revelation 12.1 that's going to happen during some point in those eight days, which I showed you in Luke 22, I believe would be that 25th of, uh, of this month if that's where the 50 days and the 40 days start. There's only one thing. A great wonder who is a woman appearing in heaven. So let's look into this a little bit more. What is this great wonder that we could see potentially, well, that we would see appear in heaven? Well, we've shared on this, right? Remember, we're putting this together now for all of the, the Revelation 12. When we go to Acts chapter 19, we found that it's about Ephesus. What was Ephesus? Ephesus was the first one. What is this Ephesus apostolic portion? It's the first eight days. Remember, he meets with John's group to start the 50 days. And when he meets in John's resurrection story, who is it? It's the apostles that he met with first. This right here relates, this portion right here, whoops, the Ephesus portion relates to the beginning of the 50 days. It relates to those first seven to the eight days. They're still going to be here. They're going to remain here during seals, but this specific portion is that seven to the eight days. At the eighth day, the 40 days begin. It starts the Smyrna, Smyrna group. They're going to still be here after the 40 days, and they're also going to work seals. And then what's Pergamum? Pergamum starts at the 14 years of tribulation. You following? But this all this group is still going to remain during seals. So this right here, Ephesus, the, the apostolic portion, when the apostles are going to be chosen, starts the time with Ephesus. And what is the story about Ephesus? They were worshiping the goddess Diana, right? Listen to this. In 19, 20, Acts 19, verse 27. So, uh, so that not only this, our craft is in danger uh, to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana. What is it? It's a great sign in heaven. What is a great sign in heaven? Who is a woman? It's a great sign in heaven who's a woman. This is called the great goddess. What does goddess mean? Heavenly. You see? It means heavenly. It's a, it's a deity from above. Okay? That's what it means. She's a goddess. So the great goddess, Diana. And it said, should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed. Now listen to this. Whom all Asia, listen to this. And the world worshipeth. Uh-oh. Do you guys know of, of, a, of a goddess type woman that is worshipped by the world church? Right? Let's look, look at this word worship. To revere, to adore, devout religious worship. Is there any great woman who has been put on a pedestal that the world of church worships, okay? Obviously not every part of the church, but the majority of the Christian quote-unquote world worships who is a woman that is rig religiously worshipped, revered, and adored in devout observation. Of course there is, right? We all know her well. Virgo. Right? Mary. What happened to Mary? Mary has been worshipped as a mother goddess. You see? She has a connection to being worshipped, to being the great mother, to being devotional to the goddess. 
And we taught on this in a recent video that what the church did, what you see the queen of heaven, here's some of her names, the queen of heaven. Okay, it's all in relation to Revelation 12. And in Revelation 12, they will also relate it to Virgo. But what else do we know? Well, according to Acts 19, this great goddess is Diana. And in a previous video on this, we shared how when the church was starting and how they were trying to, to get Diana to stop is they merged aspects of Diana with Mary. And so when we see this great sign and we know this great sign's coming and it's related to only this first week portion and it's related to Ephesus and there was a great goddess related to Revelation 12, 1. Well, what happens when we went and looked at the goddess Diana? This was the sculpture of the goddess Diana or one of them. They changed her name and made her goddess, the, the hunter and everything else. But this was the original one. And you see all these bumps on here. They're, they're to represent breasts with fertility and everything else. But where did it come from? As you guys know, as we talk, spoke about this before, this was representative of the meteor that landed in Ephesus for which they made an image as a woman from this that fell from heaven. We are looking for a period of time of Ephesus that would relate to this one week before the 40 days that according to John had to be a period when he meets with the apostles first, which is that apostolic Ephesus portion before he goes and meets with the Luke group to escape the group and for the worker group of Luke that remain, which means only in this period of time, only there is a portion of Ephesus where there is a great sign in heaven that everybody is looking at, ooing and awing. That comes first. And what do we know about this great goddess Diana? Outside of the fact that she's represented, she was she was made based on a meteor. Well, it also says right here, right in uh, in Acts nineteen thirty five, it says, and when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, "Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that this city of the Ephesians is a worshipper of the great goddess Diana?" and the image which fell down from Jupiter. See? Aerolite. Meteor that fell from the sky. Ephesians, Ephesus is the only portion that begins it all, and it started with a meteorite. See how wild this is? We now have that connection to the only piece that had been troubling us for so long, this one missing piece and the understanding of it. We got it. This relates to Ephesus. This relates to the first week before the escape, the 40 days of the Son of Man, the 14 years of tribulation beginning. So what do we then get here? Eight days, escape, 40 days, beginning of the 14 years. And where does the beginning of the 14 years start? Just like Luke 21 said. <laughs> a lot of highlights, it takes a minute. What does it say? Then said he unto them, because he's talking to, to the other group. He's talking as if to Mark and Matthew, because this isn't going to be experienced by this group. Then he says, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, earthquakes and so forth, fearful sights. And what do we end up getting? The exact same storyline as we did from 2 Ezra's chapter 13, starting in verse 29. The exact same storyline is playing out. 
So when we go further into Luke 21, he tells us in, in Luke's discourse of the coming of the Son of Man. You see, in Luke's discourse of the coming of the Son of Man is before all these things begin. This is what you're going to see happening, and boom, you're going to be gone. And then the 40 days of these events that he's talking about right here that start with but before. The bride isn't going to experience all of this. Only that worker group and those coming to Christ during that time and into seals. When you get to this about this, the coming of the Son of Man in Luke's discourse, it's before all of that starts, with exception of seeing Revelation 12.1. When you go read it in Mark's discourse, Mark's discourse is after the six years of seals. Matthew's is after the six years of trumpets. Okay? That's what it relates to. This one is before because the bride is taken out before all these things come to pass. Remember what it says in uh, Luke 21, 36? Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. All these things that shall come to pass. What all these things? All these things that are spoken about in Luke's discourse. That's why you don't get the same conversation. You don't have that wording in Mark's discourse or in Matthew's discourse. So what does it tell us in Luke 21, 25 through 28? It says, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Ah, oh, hold on a second. There's going to be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Uh, what was that? The sun, the moon, and stars? Hello. Starting to make sense now? <laughs> I hope so, because we got it. This is understood, guys. Let's keep going. Uh, and the stars upon the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men hearts, men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Hello? They're failing, their hearts are failing, looking after these things that are breaking through. And when you shall see, the, uh, sorry, and then shall ye see the Son of Man coming in, okay? It's literally the word in a single cloud. When you watch the, the differences in the discourses video, you're going to see that in Luke's only, it says in a single cloud. In Mark's, it says the same in clouds, plural. And in Matthew, it says in, but it's not the word in. It's 1906 or something like that, or 1901, something like that. And it actually means on, and it's plural clouds. Why? Because in Matthew, when he comes at the end, it's when the whole world is going to see him as lightning from one end unto the other. Okay? This is in a single cloud and the uh, with power and great glory. And when you see, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. Your redemption is at hand. Brothers and sisters, this is what we are expecting. This is what we are looking for, for those who are watching and praying. This is what we are watching for. We are watching for the true Revelation 12:1 literal event. To then look up because our redemption's at hand. Then the 40 days of the Son of Man, <clears throat> with the workers with them, seals workers with them, and the apostles a part of it somewhere. And then you have what? Pain. This is the beginning of tribulation, the beginning of the 14 years, while the first seven days. The bride is taking place, uh, the wedding is taking place in heaven. The Holy Spirit will be there. Jesus will be there. And we'll all be there while all the chaos has broken out on the earth. 
at the time when the 14 years begin. You see, if we go to Revelation chapter 6, look what happens after the white horse rider. Uh, verse 4, Revelation 6, 4, and there went on another horse that was red and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. Who's peace? The, whole, the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost is removed from the earth. The only ones with the Spirit of God in them will be the disciples and the apostles. Just like it was at the beginning of the is. But this time, it's going to be amplified. It's going to be much greater than it was back then. And then what does it say? And that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. How long does this pain last? It lasts for two and a half years. It is a two and a half year period. And we can know this because then look at what we see. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. What's happening here? What is verse 3 telling us? Verse 3 is talking to us about another sign that is seen after the pain, after the tribulation of the, uh, of, uh, of the two and a half years of World War III, at the point where the world is crying out for any savior to come, for anybody. They're starving. They're dying. They're, they're eating each other. They're, they're, it's death and, and destruction so in so many places. But we find out that's just the beginning, right? This is, this is where we're in Mark. You're now in Mark's discourse. In Mark chapter 13, you see it right here. Here it is. This is how it starts. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles, which is roilings of water because there's going to be tsunami stuff. And these are the beginnings of sorrows. You see that? What's this right here? That's two and a half years of seals. That's your first two and a half years of World War III and famines and chaos. It's the beginning of tribulation. Do you notice this is an awesome one? We, when you watch the, the video on the discourse is revealed, what you'll notice is, of course, there's no conversation about it in Luke's discourse. When you get to Mark's discourse, the beginning of the seven years, right here, starting at Nation Against Nation, when you get to this, look what happens. You see, um, there. After the two and a half years, we know that all of a sudden they're going to start to be brought before councils and rulers. Uh, men are going to be put to death again. Don't worry. The Holy Ghost is going to speak for you. Uh, you're going to be betrayed by brother and father and son and so on and so forth. Okay, you're going to be hated of all men for my name's sake. At what point does this really kick off? It'll be going on during the first two and a half years during the first two and a half years of, of the World War III uh, all over the world. But when does this really kick off, this betrayal, because of Jesus' name? you got to remember, during the first two and a half years of seals is going to be a period of revival like the world has never seen. Remember, in the midst of great chaos is greatest revival ever because people are going to be screaming out for a Savior, for somebody to help them and save them. But then what happens? the abomination of desolation. Do you notice who's not here in this first part of Mark's discourse? There's no false prophets and there's no antichrist. The first half or the first two and a half years, it's only World War III. There's no antichrist, false prophets, nothing. It's not until like you get to Revelation chapter 12 <laughs> and at verse three that we see this great red dragon that appears. And what happens with this great red dragon? Look what happens when we go to verse thir uh, chapter 13. In chapter 13, it says, And I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven, ho uh, seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns seven crowns, uh, in the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. Okay, that's the body. That's, that's the part that's going to be the control center during World War III that the beast is going to take over. His feet were like unto a bear. That's Russia 
who was trampling these nations during World War III. And his mouth as the mouth of a lion. That's Syria, Assad, who started the attack on Jerusalem and began the nation against nation. And what does it say? And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his authority. So the Antichrist doesn't show up or, or officially get his power as that beast until after World War III. You see, that's why we read in verse 3, it says, uh, da, 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 no, in verse 4, it says, and they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with them? Okay, he's going to settle down that World War III. He's going to stand up as that savior, having been given power by the dragon. When did the dragon show up? Not until verse 3 of Revelation chapter 12. Hello. After the terrible portions of World War III had taken place. You following? So how do we know that the whole World War III is about the first two and a half year portion? Well, when you go to Revelation 13, when the dragon now gives them that power and that authority, saying who can make war against them? We go to Revelation 13, verse 5, and it says, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 42 months. Okay? He was here before, but this official power of being the one who will stand up as the Christ. Who do we know he is? He's an Arab. We know he's an Arab. That's the revelation in, 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 um, in uh, Genesis chapter 8 with the raven. It's the revelation of, um, uh, 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 of Ishmael. Right? That dark colored hue of skin. And it's called Arab, it says. This is the Arab Mahdi that they've been waiting for. This is who the Antichrist is going to be. And he's now given power for 42 months when the dragon had shown up. You see? And look at what he does. At here, you don't see him trying to take over the position of God the Father. He blasphemes with an open mouth. With his mouth, he speaks against God to blaspheme his name. This is against Jesus <coughs> and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And then we see in, verse, uh, in chapter 13, verse 7, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given unto him over all kindred and tongues and nations. You see? How long is he going to be ruling like this for? For 42 months after World War III when the dragon gives him his power. That is what Revelation chapter 12 verse 3 is telling you when the dragon shows up that is going to give that power to the beast. Then what do we see in Revelation 12 4? In Revelation 12, 4, we see, And his tail drew the third of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. What is this third of the stars of heaven being cast to the earth? Go to Revelation chapter 6 and look at what we see. We see in the sixth seal, uh, da, 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 in starting in Revelation 6, verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of, sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig casts her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the uh, the rocks of the mountains, and said unto the mountains, 
and said unto the mountains and rocks, okay, we'll get to that one in a minute. We'll get to verse 16 in a minute. There's the time of the stars being cast to the earth. Where do you see it? Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. Why are these being cast to the earth? Why are these stars being thrown? Well, look what happens when you get to verse 5. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Who do you think this is? This is Jesus coming at the end of the sixth seal. When you go to Revelation 6 and you see what happens after the, the star is being thrown down, we get to verse 16 and 17, and it says, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of of him that sits on the throne, comma, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come. So if the Antichrist, if the beast had three and a half years, 42 months of ruling and reigning, to the time when the Lord comes, this is when he comes on heavenly Mount Zion. This is the Mark discourse when you see him, when they see him coming in the clouds for those that are ready. They're going to finally see him coming in the plural clouds. The world is freaking out. They don't see him, but they understand that this is coming. It's going to be heavenly Mount Zion. He's coming with paradise. Look, if you go to Mark chapter 13, we could show the exact same scenario. Because remember what it said? Remember what I was showing you? The first two and a half years, there's no false prophets, no antichrists. It's not till the time of the abomination of desolation, which there are two for those that don't know. You go into Daniel chapter 11, there's one abomination of, de of desolation. You go to uh, uh, Daniel chapter 12, there's another abomination of desolation. They're not the same when you understand who the Gospels are speaking to. And so what is he saying? Here's this abomination of desolation now about to take place, which is the mark of the beast one. Now they're to flee. Woe to them are with child and give suck. You see, there's still kids in those days. This is about two and a half years or so into seals. And then look at what it says. In Mark 13, verse 22, for false Christs and false prophets shall arise. Hello. Exactly. Because it's at this time here that the Antichrist is given his power by the dragon to continue now 42 months. And when you go into Revelation chapter 13, what do we know about this abomination? When the second beast, the fall, this is the, the false prophet, okay, showing signs and wonders. And what does he cause them all to do? Worship the first beast. And it's the time that they cannot buy or sell, save they have the mark, his name, or the number of his name, or worship him, right? This starts, this is the abomination of desolation that is coinciding in Revelation chapter 12 at the time frame when the red dragon is seen who then gives the power to the beast to then receive power to continue 42 months. Towards the end of, in the, in the beginning maybe, in that time frame of the sixth year of seals, a third of the stars, the th stars are cast down and the Lord is seen coming. The heavenly Mount Zion is coming down. The whole world is freaking out. And we saw that at the end of the sixth seal. And what do we see? She brought forth a man-child who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And who does the Lord use to be the rod of iron who's going to go out through all the nations when he's here as Melchizedek, the king and high priest? From Mount Zion. Who, who is this point? What is now? Th what's this point? We've now seen him coming at the end of the sixth seal. He's now to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And what do we see? Well, we can go first into Daniel chapter 7. And what we see in Daniel 7 is the same story. There's the lion, Assad, that attacked Jerusalem first. There's the bear, the destroyer of the Gentiles, World War III then breaking out. There's the leopard, the one that will have the, the control center of everything during tribulation. And then you have the fourth beast who stamped the residue with his feet, and it had ten horns. This is when the beast is given power to continue 42 months. And his power will last 
till the end of the sixth year of seals when they see what? Daniel 7 verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame and his wheels as a burning fire. Fire stream, uh, A fiery stream issued and came forth before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him and 10,000 times 10,000, that's the Gentiles, stood before him. Hello. This is that group that you see in Revelation chapter 5, I believe it is. And then what do you see? Uh, verse 11, I beheld then because the voice of the great words. You see, Revelation 13, it, he was speaking blasphemy. He was always speaking these great words. Which the horn spake, <coughs> I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body was destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. And then when verse 13, I saw in the night visions and I be, and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven. Remember Mark's discourse? That's when he's coming in the clouds, plural. And came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom. You see, this is the end of seals. When you go now back to Revelation and you see from Revelation chapter 12, verse 5, when he's to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Well, if he's coming at the end of Revelation 6 is when they see him come and he destroys the Antichrist. Then you go to Revelation chapter 7, which is before Revelation chapter, uh, uh, before the seventh seal. And what do you see? He seals the 144,000 who are going to rule with them during the time of the first half of trumpets. They're ruling with them and they're going to help bring in the rapture of the great multitude because there's not enough workers remaining in seals to bring them all in. So the first thing the 144,000 are going to do after they're sealed is they're going to bring in the great multitude, which no man can number. This is the rapture of the great multitude in the seventh year of seals. And when you go to Revelation chapter 12, this exact storyline follows. When you go back to verse 5, and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up. Remember 2 Corinthians 12, <clears throat> the second one where the was caught up was, they go to where? To paradise. Remember, he came down with heavenly Mount Zion in paradise. That's where the rapture group is going. Hello. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had the place prepared of God that they should feed her there 1260 days. Now we get to the next part. The seven years of seals come to an end, right? In the seventh year, the rapture takes place. Then the seventh seal happens. And the seventh seal is a period of silence, is a period of peace where the Son of Man is making a covenant with all nations. There's going to be a covenant. Remember, the two witnesses show up. We've done a video on the two witnesses. If you don't know it, you can go and watch it. The two witnesses show up of which, believe it or not, for those that are unaware that haven't heard this yet, Jesus is going to be the Son of Man is one of the two witnesses. He is the Joshua Yeshua type. Okay? Just like Moses, he couldn't bring them into the promised land. Here comes Jesus, end of the sixth seal. And what does he do? He brings them over into the promised land. Okay, he's bringing them into paradise. That's that rapture group. And you know that there's two. Well, one of them is the king and high priest. That's Melchizedek, the one closest to the father, right? The son. The other one is the one who's going to be responsible in the overseeing of the rebuilding of the temple, which, when you go to Zechariah, is Zerubbabel. During the time of seals, Zerubbabel, with a group of men, will lay the foundation in Jerusalem. 
But that's all that's going to happen there during the seven years. We've got videos on that as well. And when this time comes and the, and the seven years of seals are over, now the seven years of trumpets begin. When the seven years of trumpets begin, it's what? <laughs> it starts with 1260 days. If you remember, the two witnesses, the two witnesses prophesy and do their work after seals. You see, there's your 42 months. See, tr they shall tread underfoot 42 months. Remember what we saw the beast in Daniel chapter 7? The beast tread underfoot. What did Revelation 13 say? That he had the ability for 42 months? Once that's all over, the rapture has happened. The Lord is there on Mount Zion. Power is given, you see, to the two witnesses. And how long is their portion? 1260 days. Revelation chapter 12 tells us in verse 6, the next portion of time is 1260 days. What's happening now during these 1260 days? They're rebuilding the temple. For those, you guys know this one very well. See, Zechariah 14 chapters. Because Zechariah is written to the Jews. You go to Hosea. Hosea is written to the Gentiles. You have 14 in, in, in uh, Hosea. You've got 14 chapters in Zechariah. There's a typology of the 14 years events playing out within it. And Zechariah is a gold mine. You go to Zechariah chapter 8 as what? Seven years of seals are over. There's your beginning of trumpets. And look at this. The Lord's returned. Here he is. He's on Mount Zion. I am returned unto Zion. And will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. He then tells them what? Um, he's going to bring them. They're going to dwell in the midst. In verse uh, Zechariah 8, verse 9, he tells them, Let your hands be strong, you that hear in these days the words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the Lord of, of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. Okay? The foundation was laid during the midst of seals. Only that was laid at that time. And then when the seven years of trumpets begin, the Lord is there and the rebuilding of the temple is going to take place. And when we go to Revelation chapter 14, what you end up seeing is you see the Son of Man, right? The Lamb who stood on Mount Zion. You see, that must have been a mystery to everybody too. How on earth was the Lamb... The lamb standing on Mount Zion with the 144,000 when the 144,000 are going out throughout the earth. Hello. Because heavenly Mount Zion has come down. That's how they were standing before the Lord as well. Being redeemed from among men, virgins, right, from the earth. This is the first fruits unto the Lord and unto the lamb. Not the first fruits wheat, first fruits of grapes. You following? Go back to Revelation chapter 12. And what you end up seeing during this 1260 days, what's going to be happen, happening in heaven? And there was a great war in heaven, starting Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. This great war in heaven. It says, And Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, uh, and uh, fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. How long is this fight going to last? 1260 days. While the temple is being rebuilt and the city is being rebuilt. Okay. While that's happening for the first three and a half years of trumpets for 1260 days. There's going to be a battle in heaven with the good angels and the bad angels. The Antichrist, remember, he was already killed. For now. He was already killed for now. So what's happening during this 1260, the first three and a half years of trumpets, city and streets, the temple is being rebuilt. And there's a battle in heaven with Michael and his angels against Satan and his angels. And what else is happening? The first four trumpets. The first four trumpets outside of Jerusalem in all parts of the world, you're seeing in Revelation chapter 8, the beginning of the seven trumpets. It doesn't mean, by the way, that it's one the first year, one the second year, one the third year. That's not how it's going to work. 
right? Some will overlap, one will happen, then another will start, and some will overlap with another one, and another one begins. It doesn't mean one year, one year, one year. And look at what we see. Look, a third of the trees was burnt up in all green grass. Uh, fire cast into the sea, and a third of all of it came blood. Uh, what else? A third angel, a great star, and a third of the rivers, the fresh water, right? What was the next one? Uh, the fourth one sounded. And a third of the sun and a third of the moon was darkened. And then you have the woe, woe, woe for the final three trumpets. That means these first four trumpets take place during the first three and a half years of trumpets. Excuse me, during that 1260 days, which is the time of the two witnesses, while one is the king in Melchizedek. The other one is Zerubbabel rebuilding, like Zechariah said, that he would be the one. You saw the plummet was in his hand. He laid the foundation. He's also going to be the one to finish building. And now when we go back to Revelation chapter 12, we see that fight that happened. Uh, chapter 12, verse 7, you saw the battle that was taking place. When that battle is done, it goes on to verse 8. And it said, and prevailed not neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth. <clears throat> and his angels were cast out with him. Yikes. You see, when you go to the discourses, we're done in Mark. Obviously, right? The seven years of seals, the mark portion, right? The church, the sleeping church, the house of Israel, the world, this portion is now done. But you see, when the abomination of desolation, when the Antichrist took over, and it was the mark of the beast time, we're told that this would be a time on earth of affliction such as was not since the beginning of creation, which God created unto this time. Hello. That's only the second half of seals. Okay, And like I said, what do you see in the second half of seals? Well, you saw false Christ and false prophets. When we go to Ma Matthew's discourse, what happens at the end of seals? So what would happen at the end of Mark's discourse when the Lord came? Okay, here he is coming in the clouds, plural, like I said. And what ends up happening? The Antichrist was killed, just like we saw in Daniel 7. So when we go to Matthew chapter 24, look at what we see. In Matthew chapter 24, watch this. In Matthew 24, verse 11, before the abomination of desolation, in verse 11 it says, And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. Do you see any mention of false prophets like you did in the second half of Mark? No. Because the meaning of the false prophet there, of the Antichrist, the Antichrist was killed at the end of seals. That's why you only have false prophets being talked about in the first half of Matthew. Remember, he only killed the, the Antichrist. He never killed the false prophet or the ten kings. They just had all their dominion taken away. But the false prophet is still here. This is the first half of trumpets. And look at what happens now. At mid trumpets. And then you have another abomination of desolation. And it says, stand in the holy place. It's different than Mark's because the temple will have been rebuilt. So now <clears throat> you're at the 1260 days coming to an end in trumpets. And this abomination of Satan going into the temple and declaring himself God. And what is it? This is when they now must flee. And what does it say? For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time no nor shall ever be. This is going to be worse than the craziness of how terrible it's going to be during seals. It seems like the first half of trumpets isn't so bad as long as you're in Jerusalem, right? You're in Jerusalem, you're in the land of the Lord, and he's reigning, but you've got all these devastations happening in different parts of the world with a third of everything being destroyed and dying. 
But then when you get to mid trumpets and you get to this abomination of desolation, if you go back into Revelation chapter 12, what is that abomination of desolation? Satan's been cast down. Satan's been cast down. Listen to what they say now that Satan and and uh, all of his angels are cast down to the earth. Could you just let that sink in for a moment? What What is that period of time? Let's go to our chart. See, it's the 11th year, about 10 and a half years in, right? Seven, three, and ten, three that's 10 and a half. So at Three and a half years into trumpets, which is ten and a half years total. Remember Psalms 90 and 10? Ten years, then a half. Or ten years, then a short period of time. And the they're going to fly away on the wings of an eagle. That's what we're talking about here. Do you know when you go to, to Zechariah, and you go to Zechariah chapter 11, because it's about ten and a half years in, it says the vintage of old has come down. This is Satan who's been cast down. For the cedar is fallen, the vintage of old is cast down, and Jesus, we see that he has to break his covenant. That I might break my covenant, which I had made with all people. And it was broken in that day. You see, when Satan is cast down from heaven and his angels with him, we can't even fathom the chaos that mid-trumpets is going to be. It says, let the rest eat, uh, eat everyone the flesh of another. This is insane. It's like, it's over the top. I think it's good that we can't fully fathom that this is reality. I am reading to you from the word of God, the infallible word of God. This is more real than even me talking to you. It's more real than if you were to pinch yourself. And it says when this is going to happen. Mid trumpets is going to be over the top bananas. Thank goodness. None of us will be here. But imagine the 144,000 workers and the anointing they're going to have. That's why they were standing before the, the before the Lord God, standing before the throne. These guys are going to be given supernatural powers, as we know, even beyond what the seals were given, because the seals workers, right, that Luke group, that portion of the Luke group in the in the resurrection story, the reason is because they could still die. The 144,000 can't be killed. Okay? Scriptures tell us that. So um, so they're going to have some incredible, incredible power. But now listen to this. We go back to Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. We're 10 and a half years into tribulation, three and a half years into trumpets. And it says in verse 10, Revelation 12, verse 10, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuseth them before our God day and night. And they um, excuse me. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, O ye heavens, and you that dwell in them. Woe! to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knows that he hath but a short time. You see that woe? You see that woe? Remember in Revelation chapter 8, after the first four trumpets, now we're at what? The fifth trumpet. When you, when you get to the fifth trumpet, so four of them are done. Now it says, saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Look at this first woe, uppercase woe. That's the same one. That's the first woe in Revelation chapter 12. What is this woe? Revelation chapter 11 tells us. Uh, sorry, Revelation 9 
says and the fifth trumpet sounded and i saw a star fall from heaven unto him uh, unto the earth and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit so so not only is satan cast down to the earth and all of his angels with him and they're literally coming to the earth to which all of heaven proclaims and rejoices because thank goodness it's over for them. But now woe to the earth. And not only that, when he comes, the bottomless pit is opened. <laughs> you thought it was already hard to imagine. Now imagine the pit being opened. Have we lost our mind? This is insane. This is insane. And who do we know comes out of the bottomless pit? Right? We know that the Antichrist is coming back. The bottomless pit, when it opens, it's going to release them. And the Antichrist is coming back. You see, if you go now back to Matthew chapter 24, right? Satan has come down. Satan's been cast down, right? There's that abomination of desolation. The temple was built. Now there's going to be this portion as we're going to get to in Revelation 12 where they're going to now flee into the wilderness. That's this part right here of Matthew 24, starting in verse 15. And it's going to be even worse, it says, than at any time in all of history, bar none, ever, and it'll never happen like that again. And then what does it say? Look at this. Matthew 24, verse 24. And there shall be false Christs and false prophets. Now, wait a second. In the first half of trumpets, it was only false prophets. Now, all of a sudden, at the abomination of desolation of Matthew, false Christs show up again. Do you know why? Of course you do. The pit has been opened. The Antichrist will return. You following? The Antichrist returns. And we can prove this by going to Revelation 16, where it tells us, where is it? In verse, uh, da, 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 where are you? Uh, right here, in verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. How is it that all three could be coming out of all of them? Because all three of them, when the Lord returns at the end of trumpets, feet down, okay? When he finally returns feet down and binds Satan up for a thousand years, who get thrown into the lake of fire first? The beast and the false prophet. How was that possible if the beast was already killed at the end of seals? Because at mid-trumpets, he comes back when the pit is opened. That's why the second half of Matthew's discourse shows the false prophets and the false Christ again because the beast has returned. It's the entire understanding of Revelation chapter 17 when it says uh, in verse 8, the beast that saw us was because he was in the second half of seals and is not. Why is not? Because for the first half of trumpets, he's not. He was killed. And shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. That's the second half of trumpets. Told you. <laughs> all from scripture, man. It is absolutely fantastic. This is all revealed through the process of the revelation of understanding who the gospels are speaking to. So now what happens? Woe to the inhabitants of the earth because the devil knows that he only has a short time. So his wrath is going to be unbelievable. And he's going to have all his minions with him. Watch this. Let's see how long this period of time is going to last. How can we know it's two and a half years? Well, remember, we're now at mid-trumpets, right? Watch this. If we're at mid-trumpets to the end of 14 years, only leaves three and a half years. Okay, if there's only three and a half years left and he's got but a short period of time, does he have the full three and a half years? Let, let me let's go a little bit further here to verse 14 and then we'll go to the Daniel one. 
So we know that he only has but a short period of time. Verse 13 says, and the dragon, uh, and when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child, and the and to the woman were given wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness. Matthew twenty four. Okay, not only Matthew twenty four, Psalms ninety verse ten. At ten and a half years, flying away on the wings of an eagle, into her place, into her place where she is nourished for a time comma, and, times, comma, and, half a time. That's one, plus two, that's three, plus a half. That's three and a half years. What does that take us to? It takes us to the end of Psalms 90 and 10, and it takes us to the end of 14 years. How does it start? He's going to persecute the woman, and what is he going to do? And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of a flood. The earth opened up and helped the woman. What do we see in Daniel chapter 9? In Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, here's the three and a half years of trumpets that have taken place, and Messiah is now cut off. Okay? The two witnesses, their time is being cut off now. But not for himself, but for the people of the prince. Remember, the pit is open. Satan's been cast down and shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. So he goes after her with what? A flood, right? And then what does it say? And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. What war? This is the war that he makes against the two witnesses during his short time here. How long in those three and a half years of time and time and half a time, how much of that time is his short period of time? The answer is given to us in Revelation chapter, uh, in Daniel chapter 12. In Daniel 12, uh, in verse 7, it says, And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, uh, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, comma, no and, times, comma, and a half. That's one, not plus two. It's one, two, plus a half. That's two and a half years. We have been taught this wrong the whole time. They never knew that there was a difference because there was no and in the middle. You've been taught all your lives that this is the same as Revelation 12, verse 14. It's not the exact same. Is it the same period of time? Yes, but it's one year shorter. And it shall be for a time, times and a half, for two and a half years. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So Satan's time in this absolute chaotic Final three and a half years of trumpets, Satan's period, Satan's portion is going to last for two and a half of the final three and a half years. If you go to Revelation 10, you can see where it ends. In, in verse 7, it says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, that's the seventh trumpet, see? when he shall begin to sound. So right as the seventh angel is about to begin at the end of six years to the very start of the seventh year of trumpets, this angel is beginning to sound the seventh trumpet. The mystery of God should be finished as he declared it to his servants, the prophets. When is it finished? Satan's time is over after two and a half years. That war is against the two witnesses that will last for two and a half years. And when the seventh year is about to start, as it's about to sound, what do you think it means that the mystery of God is finished? You want to know what that means? It means Revelation, uh, sorry, it means Matthew 24, right here, 
in Matthew chapter 24, at the beginning of the seventh year, after the end of six years of trumpets, this is what's coming. Immediately after, you see that? You don't read that in any other discourse. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars uh, and the stars shall fall from heaven and all the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in. Remember I told you it wasn't in? There it is, 1909. It means on the clouds. You see? And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. The seventh trumpet. Because the mystery of God will be finished when Satan's two and a half years are over. That's why back in Daniel chapter um, in Daniel chapter 9, that's why you see this final verse in 27 when it says, and he shall confirm a covenant for one week. It's the final year. Who is confirming this covenant? It is Jesus when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. He is going to confirm the covenant that he made at the seventh seal. <coughs> Excuse me. He's going to confirm that covenant. Remember, at mid-trumpets, he had to break it. He had to break it. He had to be cut off, but not for himself. It was the war that lasted for two and a half years against the witnesses. He had to break the covenant that he had made with all nations. And when it's over, at the seventh trumpet, after he destroys the enemy, he's going to confirm that covenant that he made at the start of trumpets, that he cut off at mid-trumpets because Satan had been cast down. <coughs> That's why going back into Revelation, going into chapter 11, you see it right here. That uh, right here. Uh, verse 11, Revelation 11, verse, uh, verse 7. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. We know that they're killed, what? At the end of the sixth see, uh, at the end of the sixth trumpet. You see? And in the same hour when they stood up, there was a great earthquake, and what was it? The second woe is past. The sixth year of trumpets is over. That war against the two witnesses lasted for two and a half years. And right near the end of the sixth year of trumpets, the 13 years total, the two witnesses are killed. And what was the story in Matthew that never happened like Jonah? When he was in the heart of the belly of the fish, and Jesus says that he would be as Jonah was in Matthew, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. If you're three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, that means it's sometime on the fourth day. What does this say? And after three days and a half, the Spirit of God entered them. And what do we know has happened? The seventh trumpet is about to sound. And when the seventh trumpet sounds at the start of the seventh year of trumpets, the mystery is over. Did you follow that? I love doing videos like this, man. I, I, I could do them in my sleep, but I love it. It is so exciting. You see, it even talks about it here in Revelation 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which kept the commandments of God and have a testimony and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Okay? But how do we know how long this period was? Right here. This is the final three and a half years that they fled into the wilderness. So remember, out of the final three and a half years, Satan only had two and a half. And then the final year is when the Lord returns feet down after the, the coming back after being one of the two witnesses. He returns feet down on the Mount of Olives, and he fulfills that final year, to which he does what? He renews the covenant. Well, what is the story? Remember I said it's like the first seven of Luke at the beginning? You had the seven of seals, seven of trumpets. 
what happens that we're talking about right here? The end of 13 years, the end of the sixth trumpet. What happens at the end of 20 years when he completed, when Jacob completed 20 years with his father-in-law? What ended up happening? Is it 31? What does he end up, what ended up happening? I think verse 41. Yeah. In Genesis 31, verse 41, he says, I have been 20 years. What are we saying the story represents like Jacob? Boom. 20 years. That 13th year of trumpets when it's over is the same as 20 years when it's over. And what does he say? Uh, 20 years in thy house, I served 14, not our 14. It's the seven easy years and the seven years of seals for thy two daughters and six years for the cattle. That's the six years of trumpets. And you've changed my wages 10 times. And then listen to what he says, verse 44. Now, therefore, come thou, let us make a covenant. You see that? Makes a covenant when? After 20 years. What's the typology after the 13 years of trumpets for the 14th and final year? The Lord renews the covenant. Isn't this awesome? It's absolutely mind-blowing. And so this is what we're seeing in Revelation chapter 12. That group that went in, that flew away on the wings of an eagle for the final three and a half years, they're going to remain there till the entire final year is over. And when that final year is over, when Satan is bound, when the, when the false prophet and the Antichrist are thrown, the first two thrown into the pit to the lake of fire, and all of that is settled. We know that the Lord will renew the earth from Jerusalem, from the throne. The water will go out and will renew the earth. And when that happens, those that were in the wilderness till the end of the 14 years are brought back from the wilderness and they are given the division of their lands at the end of the three and a half years, which is the end of the 14 years. And that will be. The final jubilee, which you can say is the 15th year from tribulation. You could say it's the 22 in the big picture. And it's really from the sevens of the Shemitahs. It's as if the 50th year and the final jubilee. And I could show you where it is as I finish this up in Zechariah, starting from 47, the end of 47. See that? Water flowing from the temple. This is when he's going to renew the earth. He's going to repair, renew the earth, and then it's going to be the division of land. And the first two are going to go to Joseph with his two sons. And then when you go to 48, you see all of these divisions from Dan, Asher, Nathali, Methu uh, uh, Manasseh. Brothers and sisters, that is the final jubilee in the 50th year from tribulation all in order every piece of scripture relating to their season and time all revealed to us in one chapter as an overarching story over the whole thing from revelation chapter 12 my friends this is so exciting and what does it begin with with an event that must take place first as this woman in heaven, a, a sign that we're going to see an event that is going to cause us to look with eyes wide open at something remarkable that is related to Ephesus. And as we've been revealed is the stone's throw just as the goddess Diana was started by a meteor. If we have finally understood, my friends, brothers and sisters around the world, this is that time. This is it. So if you don't see any, you're, you're coming into Friday, into Saturday, and you still haven't seen a stone's throw, it's probably not the time. That's, that's what alleviates me as, I, as I'm looking excitedly for the next time. 
If I don't see that stone's throw, oh, it doesn't mean I stop looking. Of course, we're still looking. I just know that we are going to see this event that comes first. The word has revealed it to us. You can't tell me I don't understand Revelation. I just showed you the 14 years in one entire chapter. And the count the Lord told us is to the time of the year's end when the gathering of the harvest is done and the celebration begins. There is no other 50-day count left in a new Shemitah year cycle to the fall feast of the Lord. Get excited. <laughs> Get excited, man. We are knocking on the door and we're about to find out. Remember, could you imagine when you're going to see this meteor coming, this event? You're going to know. When we know that we know, when we can see it and, and this is really starting to take place, you can go tell all of your family and friends. You can point them to these videos and, and these portions of these videos. You don't have to watch the whole thing. You can say, look, play this. Just play this five, ten minutes where he's talking about it. This is what we knew was coming. Did you know that a week ago? I didn't. And maybe we can save the last few minutes. We can have a few more hitting their knees and crying out to the Lord in repentance. So awesome. Told you guys, it's just absolutely incredible. For anybody new, go watch that playlist. For everybody that supported and for everybody with your prayers over me and my family, the ministry, and over all of each other, thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you guys. God bless you all, and we'll talk to you again soon. Bye for now.